This is a design from Trust Call on February 6, 2019. We are designing design from trust workshops, but we're in a general conversation about webs of trust and other kinds of things. And, and Christopher was just explaining some of what was happening with their rebooting webs of trust uh, initiatives. So uh, back to you, Christopher. Yeah, well, I don't want to necessarily dominate the conversation. It's just it's coming up in a month and uh, we've got a lot of things that, um, you know, I think, you know, are relevant to your discussions and I'd love to have some inter, um, I mean, there's a, there's just a bunch of things going on, like this whole area. I know April, I don't know if she's on the call, but, um, uh, sh you know, there's been a bunch of stuff around crossing borders and what is citizenship and what is sovereignty in a world where every nation is kind of renegotiating what it is the means to be sovereign and, and corporations are sovereign, sovereign, but people aren't. <laughs> so, uh, uh, so we have people like, I mean, the next events at Barcelona in the Barcelona government conference, you know, conference center because of, you know, the politics of Barcelona feeling like, you know, they want to have a different relationship with the, with the, Europe and Spain and the rest of the world than what is currently accepted. Similarly, we've had some calls from Taiwan and I was in Taiwan and sp spoke with a number of people at the Taiwanese government who have, you know, their own issues of, you know, their own sovereignty, but also like what happens when and likely will when China basically pushes things over the, the edge. So, <laughs> um, Super interesting. I think that, um, are you familiar with the V Taiwan people? Um, a little bit. I haven't met any of them. Uh, so uh, Taiwan has a minister with our portfolio named Audrey Tang, um, who I've met and uh, we, we've had a Zoom recorded call, stuff like that. And <laughs> she basically, um, after the sunflower revolution in Taiwan, or as part of that, she started creating a platform for citizens to connect and talk that ended up becoming uh, a legitimate thing that the government of Taiwan wanted to do more of. So it's become yeah. V Taiwan and they have a platform called Polis. Um, I can put some links in here uh, in our chat. Yeah. I was supposed to meet with her at the last one, but I did end up meeting with some government min ministers and she had, and you are correct. The, you know, uh, there was one, I know it's not a Senator. I forgot what his official, if he, you know, but he's, you know, equivalent of Senator. Um, and, uh, you know, he also is a supporter of it. So yeah, there's a lot of interesting things, but they're down to like only 15 nations in the world that uh, accept that um, Taiwan is a, uh, is a sovereign state. And they look at Hong Kong and all the promises that were made there of sort of an autonomous, you know, a semi-autonomous place and uh you know um china is violating that all over um you know i've been at scotland um you know there's a, a sort of a hidden story there about why scott the scottish parliament uh members uh voted for brexit mm -hmm. um which had a lot to do with the fact that they got a kind of a side agreement from theresa may's government that their promise not to have a referendum uh, about Scottish independence um, could be abrogated. They can bring it up sooner than the 10 years or 12 years or whatever it was they promised. So they basically voted for Brexit, not because they want Brexit, it's because they want Scot Scotland to exit. <laughs> exactly. Um, <clears throat> uh, Scotland to exit the UK. Yeah. yeah. And join the EU. Yeah. Uh, the, 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 it's complicated, but uh, yeah. I'm, I'm showing also, uh, some of the articles. There's, yeah, there's two tribes in, um, oh, no, excuse me. There is a single tribe of uh, native uh, indigenous people in, in the North America that uh, whose borders are half in Canada and half in the U.S. Mm -hmm. And they consider themselves one people. Uh, Canada considers the northern half to be a sovereign. The U.S. considers the southern have to be sort of sovereign in the sort of a, a Native American way of sovereignty. But mm -hmm. in fact, neither really happens. <laughs> and, uh, you know, they're talking with us about having some kind of digital identity thing for their people. Um, 
so, I mean, it's, it feels like there's just a lot of stuff happening. Um, oddly, governments are coming on board faster than I thought. And it's largely because also there's a lot of these so like China, they're not a big fans of self-sovereign identity. Um, and, uh, uh, but if we basically say, well, translate it in China to be self-administered identity, just don't ever call it, you know, don't translate it. Don't use the word sovereignty. Right, and uh, they like it because they have problems where, you know, goods, you know, come from a semi-autonomous region, come into China, go into Hong Kong, where then they're shipped to British Columbia where then they're, you know, they go to Toronto and then, you know, go to train to New York City. So they're constantly crossing borders and having lots of problems there. So they like this sort of self-administered identity because it lets them cross borders. So mm -hmm. even in China, which is one of the people that are most, you know, the, the, that are most challenging, uh, you know, individual um, uh, sovereignty and citizenship and whatever, oddly is, you know, quasi on board when it comes to business. Mm -hmm. British Columbia is probably done the most. They have all of the corporations in British Columbia and everybody who has a business license in British Columbia now has a self-sovereign identity. Uh, they may not use it. They may not know they have it, but you know, the British Columbia's uh, you know, thing is, is supporting it. Um, so it's weird. I mean, anyhow, I, 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 I don't understand completely your workshops and your objectives and goals. I just know that there's some commonality and I want to make sure that, that, you know, your people and community um, where they intersect know what's going on. Awesome. Thank you. Judy, go ahead. A uh, couple questions. Great discussion. Thank you for your input, Christopher. Um, the thing that I'm wondering about is in terms of web of trust, which I'd not heard of until today, how would an individual like myself who's interested in building communities of trust for social action in a state like Minnesota where the Scandinavian heritage is sort of uh, cool toward aggregation in general, um, how would we use your materials? And do you have materials that help people begin to develop this type of communication? Yeah, we're beginning to, I mean, we're still in some ways early phases of proof of concepts and stuff. Um, so uh, I, I would say there are sort of, sort of three examples of what people have done. So one of which is uh, Venice did a self-sovereign thing around uh, transportation. So they basically have one iPhone app that basically works with all of the various government and non-government and NGO uh, things around transportation in Vienna in a way that you don't have to like use, you know, a, a single identity. You can bring the, 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 you know, the identities that you've already got with this, with uh, the state or with other countries or with whatever to use them in the, you know, in that thing, which uh, has some security advantages, has some advantages in Europe because of GDPR. So that's, you know, is that one, is that one Vienna or Venice? I thought it was Venice, and I'm. You said you impossible. said both words in your description, so I was curious about. Which I, I'm and I haven't heard sure, the story. I'm pretty sure that it's. Venice. You can look it up. I'm gonna have to look it up. Um, uh, anyhow, um, thanks. The, uh, um, so that's and and one example. Uh, kind of uh, another example in you know is sort of self at, you know, sort of uh, peer attestations. So there are a variety of communities that want to be able to make attestations within the community about their commitments and things of that nature in the community, but don't necessarily want these to be taken out of the community. So as an example, there is a uh, sort of, uh, you know, alternative lifestyle community that wants to be able to do various kinds of things uh, that are, you know, I mean, if you think about a marriage is, you know, you're standing in front of your community and you're basically saying, we are going to make commitments to each other and we're doing so in front of you to establish our, you know, our commitment to each other and ha have you as a community help us keep those commitments. Um, 
but they also worry about you know flying through Bahrain or something of that nature where the nature of those commitments you know mean that you know they could be arrested and mm-hmm. and in you know lose their lives in in some of the books so how do you keep that private how do you keep uh, and yet still have these attestations within the community so that's another extreme of things um the uh, the middle ground is uh the city of zug um is using something called uport to allow for um polling i mean they're technically not voting but you know various kinds of polling things kind of like the polis stuff that um uh that he was talking earlier about in taiwan except for the fact that the identities are all you own your keys you control them you know they're not you know issued by the state the state you know the city of zug basically says you bring us your keys and your data you know your your proof there we will give you an attestation that you're a citizen of zug and thus entitled to services and and other things within that um within that uh city so um uh you know uh, I'd say a fourth area is around education. Uh, so the the country of Malta in their pilot is doing, um, uh, try, they're basically trying to put all of the educational claims for things like, um, you know, uh, doctor CEUs, uh, various kinds of professional licenses that require it, ed- have educational requirements, et cetera. Uh, they're trying to set that up in a sort of a self-sovereign portable way that, you know, isn't necessarily a state issued educational credential. It's more is that you bring your educational credentials um, and can get them and, you know, get them uh, recognized uh, by Malta for your various kinds of licensing and stuff. Uh, those are some of the things that are kind of going on right now. Um, I mean, the key thing though is you, know, you want to control you want to have some measure of control over, um, you know, your digital identity at, in the same way that you have control over things in your physical physical identity. You you can move to another nation, you can move to another place, you can decide not to, you know, give uh, information to people uh um in the digital world where you know they can basically decide oh you know you're christopher allen and we know all about you because we've gotten collected all this other stuff from all these different places uh uh that's not good um Mm -hmm. and that's what we're trying to stop and i just put on the chat uh about atar in india sunil i don't know if you have any opinion on on the system um i'll share a little bit my screen about the controversies around Oh, yeah, <laughs> uh, the national ID system, which is uh, certainly controversial. Um, it is, <clears throat> it is controversial. Uh, I think it's the intent is right. The execution is wrong. Yep. And then, if I you look at right. the cultural cultural uh, construct of India, you cannot get into something um, in which ha- uh, uh, a culture or a country which has uh, illiteracy, which is almost 70 to 80 percent, and create a, an identity system which uh, those people have no clue about what they are, uh, how they are interacting with the system. Uh, yeah, the- execution, execution has been really bad. And then it's also become a little bit autocratic. The ruling party is actually going uh, about it the wrong way. So... Uh, the other way to look at it is at least uh, somebody's come up with some sort of an identity system in India and, uh, you know, a, a country of 1.3 billion people not having an identity system itself was a, a major, major gap. And also a, a big opening for corruption, for other sorts corruption, of things. Because, yes. You know, here's, yes. a, here's a bunch of money that needs to get to those people over there. The idea that it'll get to them was sort of like laughable in, in some situations, right? So, so this is a, an attempt to cut through that, and yet... Yeah, but the, the, the problem, I guess, from my point of view, is that you are, uh, you're not keeping it totally transparent, and even the tendering process is not done in a manner that's fair. Mm-hmm. So you're using corruption to cut corruption, which is not such a good idea. Mm-hmm. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, so. one of the other things that I would maybe say that is a you know a, a serious issue is um, there is especially in the civil service system and other places a strong uh, culture of um, uh, you know authority is right or whatever in the sense that you know. Um, uh, you know, a low level administrator who has a woman come up to him who is starving because her fingerprints no longer are working for her to get money from her ex, you know, from her dead husband's pension. Uh, they basically say, no, the computer's right. I don't have the authority to, to, uh, you know, help you solve this problem. Sorry, go next person. Um, and that happens a lot in the system which is kind of a, you know, uh, you know, a, um, uh, a, a cultural uh, issue as much as it is a technology issue. Um, there just isn't a lot of recourse for, for, you know, any civil servant or someone who uses these systems to be able to mitigate the, the, the fact that it's new, it's got its own problems and, and, and human issues. Um, it's 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 interesting. I mean, on the other hand, you know, I mean, you know, they do say it saved them about a billion dollars, and it cost them about a billion dollars, and those savings will only increase over time. Um, you know, so there is a, a you know a legitimate financial uh, um, you know uh, reason why they're doing some of this stuff. Um, it is kind of using twenty-year-old technology, <laughs> which worries me. But that's another story. Um, yeah, so uh, what Jerry said was actually he uh, kind of started on that example and I can share uh, a personal story way back in 2011 when Aadhaar was not even part of the scene. But they had something called, uh, they had some sort of a government scheme where what the, the whole idea was that they would be able to provide a plastic card to a manual laborer that was going to do work with the earth and would get paid a hundred rupees. A hundred rupees is like about a dollar and 20 cents, right? In today's conversion per day. Now the question was that, okay, so to go through that entire workflow, what these people needed to do, and these are people who come out in the hot sun early in the morning and are barely clad. So first, first thing that they didn't figure out was that, you know, plastic is not the right solution for these guys, right? Where, where are they going to even keep it? And then they had this problem about whether the, the handheld attendance system would even connect up to the internet. You didn't have uh, bandwidth in those uh, areas. So that's, that's something else that they had overlooked. But, you know, so uh, I don't know if you've heard about uh, this word called, let me just type it in there. This is- Zugad. Uh, yeah, exactly. I know, uh, innovation in India. Hold on, I'll share, I'll share screen. Right, so. It's not, uh, Jugad is not innovation. Jugad well, it's, is, it's a frugal innovation or, or what is no, it? No, Jerry, it's not, it's not innovation at all. It's just it's, Mickey Mousing. It's duct okay. tape innovation. It's like jury rigging? Yeah, jury rigging, yes, exactly. And so it's, it's you just keep doing Band-Aid kind of stuff. You don't, have, and see the reason Jugad became very popular was because HBR, Harvard Business Review actually picked it up and somebody wrote an article on it and so like, like all labels catch, or catch people's fancy and then go into business schools, they started claiming that Jugar was the ancient Indian uh, you know, technique. Uh, oh, they seriously? Started, they started using words like reverse, reverse innovation. And I kept wondering, I mean, what is reverse innovation? And what, <laughs> Going back to what, the dark what, ages. Yeah, so I, I really don't know what this was, right? And I was a big detractor. detractor. <laughs> I was one of the biggest, the fiercest critics of Jugar. Hmm. As, as coming into the lexicon. So, why did we start this? Yeah, okay. Uh, you, so, you're plastic talking card about a hack around that art. Sorry. So, you don't think the, you don't look, you, you don't do any big picture thinking. All you're doing is you take pieces. So, you think that the sum of the parts will become the whole magically, right? So, that's the kind of thinking it was. Mm -hmm. Just so, so, it, so what, I, what ended up happening was that, you know, they, they couldn't record the attendance. So this is, this is exactly, this is the background that I'm giving you, but then mm -hmm. coming back to what Jerry was talking about, 
Now, at the end of it, uh, after these guys have actually, okay, so let's see, let's take the best case scenario that you have uh, recorded somebody's attendance. These people have done the work uh, through the day and they're entitled to whatever 150 rupees at the end of the day. Now, the question is that if that 150 rupees at the end of the day is supposed to mitigate and give these people employment and money, then how does it make sense for you to pay them after three months or not at all, right? If, you can, if, if that's the kind of money that you're paying, you need to be able to dole it out exactly at the end of the day, like a daily wage. Mm -hmm. Now, the big, big uh, thing that loops back into this whole thing is that there might have been a huge nexus between the company that was implementing it the bureaucrat that actually ordered out the system and the guy that was going to, they called it, uh, in those days, if I'm not mistaken, they called it BC. BC stood for not British Columbia, but it stood for uh, business correspondent. It was a euphemistic way of saying, this is the guy that will actually collect the money on behalf of the beneficiary and make sure that that is actually handed over. And the excuse was that we don't have a banking system that goes all the way down to the remotest part, right? Wow. And so now what you're doing is, it's very, very interesting. The, whole, the irony of the thing or the paradox in this whole story is that you bring in a, a technology, you implement technology in piecemeal, and you leave the problem exactly the way it is, except that now you collect money from the government because you, you go virtually on horseback to collect the money based on the attendance of these people and the money never reaches these people. And they've got some excuse or the other saying, well, we cannot get your identity in place. We don't know if uh, the attendance records have matched, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, if you don't take the big picture into account, then what's going to happen is that you're going to be implementing solutions where the goons will always find a loophole to be able to get the stuff that they want. Right. Because there's, they're, they have more control, they have more access points, they have the ability to bribe or interfere, they can cause problems where there may not be any. Like, hey, our terminal didn't work in the field doesn't necessarily mean that it was impossible to get wireless connections working. It, means that, it means that somebody was simply unable to get it working and then they had to rely on a paper ledger and then, gosh, somebody spilled their, their tea on the paper ledger and it was, it was destroyed for the day. And, well, that's too bad, isn't it? Jerry, you should connect this to invisible architectures because although it's more, these problems may be more obvious in, uh, in India, this is, be, you know, this is a real problem with smart contracts and with a lot of uh, innovation um, in our various communities that there's a, a tendency to kind of uh, um, not recognize that there are these kind of perverse decisions and history and culture in the past that are this invisible architecture that forces us into particular models. Like I would argue one of the things that the blockchain ecosystem suffers from is the invisible architecture that, you know, in causes inequality in wealth. Uh, so we're just re replicating that inequality, even though all, you know, I would say, you know, the majority of the stakeholders in the broader blockchain community are going, no, we don't want that. Um, but because they're, they're building it on this base of assumptions and ways of doing things and whatever that are, you know, some of which are unconscious or have unintended system effects or whatever, uh, we just end up replicating it. Um, yeah. and, and one of the big problems <clears throat> one of the problems that a few writers are explaining well is just because something is using blockchain or some sort of uh, distributed ledger, open ledger, doesn't mean that what's going into it is right because how things got into it matters yep. like enormously, right? And so, so there's not enough attention being paid to that and, and blockchain is being used as a, a, like a blessing over systems. But you're mentioning invisible architectures brings us nicely backwards through the back door into a piece of what design from trust uh, is all about. And uh, so, so let, me, let me just riff on this for a second yep. because design from trust implies design from mistrust. And one of, my, one of my insights over the last decade was that most of our institutions are actually designed from mistrust. And that uh, design from mistrust uh, we basically say, well, there's too many people. We have to scale the system so, so much that we have to design a system that is designed to prevent the bad actors from acting badly. Uh, and 
in different ways, systems designed for mistrust create scarcity, like the school system. So we don't trust that children are curious. There's a whole bunch of them. So we separate them into one year uh, age cohorts, <clears throat> which immediately creates scarcity because in the one-room schoolhouse, when Susie was showing Bobby his numbers and teaching him, and she was like three years older, um, that was a huge lesson for both of them. That was anchoring the knowledge for Susie and getting her to understand it better and back and forth. So we create scarcity all the time. So there's this notion of hidden architectures of mistrust, which I'm trying to figure out how to explain and how to make visceral because the explicit architectures of mistrust, the ones that, you know, the barbed wire at the top of the fence, the lock on the door, the surveillance cameras, those are explicit, explicit architectures of mistrust <clears throat> that we put in to keep bad people from doing stuff or, or to protect, you know, uh, other sorts of people and surveillance is its own huge topic. Um, those are kind of easy to see. Um, the problem with the hidden architectures of mistrust is that we have normalized a lot of these behaviors so that we assume this is just the way it has to be, right? And one of the principles, one of the precepts of design from trust, and I'll head over here for a second, is uh, a very common uh, phrase from the open source community and from Wikipedia and from everywhere else, which is assume good faith or assume good intent. And this does not mean that everybody is good. This actually means you just presume the good and you act that way and then you create a very different system from doing this. So now heading back to what you were bringing into the conversation, Christopher, about you know, the, the government of Zug doesn't issue you your, your certificate. They accept the one you generated so that you created it, you own it, and they certify, they attest that you are a citizen of and therefore uh, you can get the services of the city uh, as a citizen, et cetera, et cetera. That, that's really interesting because there's, there's a whole bunch of things going on here. And then I'll, I'll say one more thing and then I'll, I'll see what y'all think. Um, one of the problems here is that we are shifting over toward electronic attestation and, and technology. A lot of stuff that I think actually is built in trust through human interaction through I attest that, that I've known Judy for a really long time and she's fantastic in conversations. And that means a lot more than the computer knowing that she's been a citizen for, for umpteen years. Um, so my fear, for instance, with Airbnb, Uber, Lyft, et cetera, is that the way that trust is created so that we climb into a stranger's car and they drive us someplace and we live in somebody, you know, we let somebody else use our home while we're away is because we have their credit card number. We've done some kind of a check on them. Who knows how flimsy that is in many cases. That's coming back to bite a lot of transportation companies, especially like Uber in India. Um, and, uh, and you know, how that plays out is interesting, but I, my fear that we're starting to um, put the, the burden of building trust onto technology, which is the wrong place, because that then precludes in many ways the normal way that we build trust, which is through human interactions. And so I'm, I'm interested in that cycle a lot. So let me, let me stop sharing and see what you've been saying on the chat and go from there. I've got a bunch of stuff. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to catch up. Um, awesome. Uh, you know, basically, there is very interesting debate right now um, in the, the, I'm trying to find my link, um, the, uh, but there is a uh, strong debate in the last month or so between various people in the blockchain community around uh, governance. And, um, you know, it started off among a kind of uh, uh, you know, somebody on the Ethereum side of the community basically said that the Zabo's law, Nick Zabo is the guy who was, you know, coined the term smart contract and sort of established a lot of the early principles of uh, blockchain uh, and cryptography in this area, um, is, very, you know, is very suspicious, unhappy, et cetera, with uh, government and any kind of, you know, he, you know, it's kind of the hyper libertarian type of stuff. Mm -hmm. So he builds trustless systems. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. Vitalik basically goes, not Vitalik, Vladimir uh, Zamfir basically wrote up this thing and said, here's Zabel Law and it's bunk. It's a serious problem. Um, and is and because, you know, ultimately it does need to be these more human systems. And then other people, you know, have played different sides of this debate. But Alex said, well, I think you're right, but I also think that you're wrong because uh, of the kinds of abuses. Um, and then other people have been figuring out, you know, talking about constrained 
versus unconstrained approaches to blockchain government governance. And then I've been trying to add the subtext, which neither of those people are talking about the larger system and how do we make them more resilient and how do we make them grow, mm -hmm. uh, you know, with principles of commons and, and all of that. So, but it's a very vibrant debate. Um, I have, I'm trying to find some, some of the better links. Um, um, I mean, I, I, I'm a pretty prolific Twitter person. So all of them are, are, uh, in my, in my Twitter. I just have to go back and find them. Um, mm -hmm. And Zabel, I've got, I'm showing here in my brain, I've got him under um, <clears throat> uh, possible candidates for who is Satoshi. Yeah, I can talk with you about that, but that's another story. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, <clears throat> but I had a couple of different uh, things here, but I did not have anything on Sable's Law. So if you have any links on that, then you can pass Yeah, I'm working, working on that right now. Um, I'll do a search on that as well. Jerry, I'm interested particularly in how we nucleate trust um, in the sense that I'm observing a lot of distrust in all types of situations, fostered in part by the political climate as well. But at, at the heart of it, it has to be a personal move to move into a position of guarded trust or presumptive trust or whatever and so there has to be a personal process that then overlays the cultural community, professional, whatever group it is in which you want to instill trust. And my observations are that in other attributes like this, innovation or various things, one person is enough to start the process if they do the right kinds of things in the right way, because it creates an alternate model that people who are even a little bit open might step toward and then it, it, it grows and so yeah it's, it's very butterfly effecty it's like there, there, there's a small things can tip and suddenly trust kind of ripples across a group and uh they can tip the wrong way and suddenly everybody's like looking at each exactly. other going what did i just step into april exactly. and i just watched the, do the netflix documentary on fire the fire festival mm -hmm. and we thought oh yeah let's just watch a couple minutes we were riveted we were, this is like this, this stupid high-end festival for rich kids that was, you know, they were going to buy a, an island in the Bahamas, blah, blah, blah. And it turns out to be this massive fraud. But, but the interviews they got were insane. And, and the level of, you know, con men play on trust, right? And, and the level of, to which personality, charisma, et cetera, et cetera, was playing a role here, you know, in the, in the fire fraud is interesting. But um, just to head back to what you're saying, part of the reason I say assume good intent um, as a starting point for design from trust is that what that does is it causes people to begin with a gesture of, of, of good, of good faith, good trust of assuming the other person is showing up with good intent. And that, if, if you prime that way, that in itself um, cascades good things. Uh, small side note, there's a novel about IT called the Phoenix project. I don't know if any of you've heard of it. Have you read it? No, but I've heard about it. So the Phoenix, it's, it's a novel about IT. And I'm like, what? And if you've ever dealt with an IT department in a large corporation, you will smile when you start reading this thing because mm -hmm. the plot begins with a mid-level IT manager who suddenly made CTO because the CTO gets fired by the boss and he inherits this nightmarish IT department, which is completely backlogged, doesn't know what it's doing. And the novel is basically an exposition of DevOps is really what it is. But, but, and this is a, a little bit of a plot spoiler, three quarters of the way through the novel, the idiot CEO who's causing a lot of the problems has a bit of a, an aha moment and he opens the next meeting in the middle of this deep crisis and he says, I have a feeling we need to sort of talk about how we got here. And he then tells his personal story and there's a moment where they go around the room and say like difficult things and, and through this gesture of vulnerability, which is one of the ways you can build trust, he begins to earn the trust of the people who've so far been hating him uh, you know, heavily and hoping that he'd just go away and the whole situation would go, go away. So I think that, that this building trust thing is something we don't culturally spend a lot of time on. We sort of, we know it's on the side, we know it when, when we see it, um, but we don't really kind of go after this in any, in any way that's interesting. And, and as I said a little earlier, we seem to be replacing it with technology more and more. Which is even harder. I mean, I remember, it was a, a key moment in my life where a fellow that I was dating for long reasons of explanation anyway, he said that I needed to be a little more cynical. 
And um, I was actually miffed by the comment. Mm -hmm. I ended up writing a note to him later saying, you know, I realize I might get hurt in situations. I'm making a conscious choice to assume trust until I have evidence to the contrary. Um, and that was in my early 20s, which has sort of persisted as an attitude as I've become older and wiser. I'm a little more astute about reading early signals and what level of assumptive trust I could give to people without any data whatsoever. And I'm much more in tune with my own intuition, which turns out to be pretty good. If mm -hmm. I'm in some kind of a bad vibe, I now totally honor that bad vibe instead of saying, you don't have any reason for that, Judy. You have no data. Uh, <laughs> conflict of intuitive versus scientific behavior. Um, but I'm really interested now in how we bring this into institutional settings, into group settings, into community action groups, because without the sense of shared trust, it's hard to unify for larger impact or change. So, so I have a, a suggestion for you there that's fairly cheap. Um, if you go on in the chat, there is a link to a good faith assumptions pattern. Okay. Um, so, uh, so first off there, you know, the pattern, the heart of the pattern is, you know, assuming other, others good intent increases trust and effectiveness instead of interpreting negative actions as attempts at manipulation, insult, or power play, we choose to believe people are doing the best they can and look for underlying values or needs in common. Searching for a better story, we find or create one. <clears throat> but in particular, if you look at the, the related pattern, so this is a pattern language I really like of um, group process that 50 facilitators with very different ways and styles of structures. No, this is the, this is oddly related to you, Jerry. Uh, um, remember we tried to do that kitchen project way like 2001? Oh, yeah. And then it was a bunch of facilitators and they all got together and it totally collapsed. I wasn't able to, to make it work because everybody had different processes. Some people wanted open space. Some people wanted structure. It just was this real mess. Well, one of the consequences is some of the people that were involved in that went outward and said, let's not talk about processes. Let's not talk about methods or any of that nature. Let's just talk about the patterns that they have in common. And they spent about three years creating this thing called the group works pattern language, which oh, is amazing. Works. And uh, um, there's a lot of depth there. So if you look at the, this good faith assumptions, it says in order to have them, here are the related patterns. You have to, people have to understand how to do appreciation. Mm -hmm. They have to understand the pattern of common ground. They have to, you know, the not about you is a fundamental, uh, you know, aspect of uh, good faith of assumptions. Sometimes when people are saying things, it's not about you, that, that there's, a, there's witness with compassion, there's 10 relationships, setting attention, et cetera. So the city of Calgary in Canada basically started adopting this, uh, this group works deck they basically have a lot of people in the, in the city of Canada um, government um, uh, not only have the deck, they got some trainings and things of that nature. So there's emerged a sort of a shared language uh, among the, the Calgary gov city government uh, around these principles uh, such that you have this wonderful kind of glass bead shortcut where um, you know, somebody at a, at, you know, even in a, like an engineering meeting uh, can just simply say the words good faith assumptions or, or, you know, one of the other patterns and boom, everybody goes, oh, right. Um, and uh, so it's, it's been a really, you know, major success story at, you know, create, you know, of helping a community have a shared language around things. Now I've been working on a, uh, another pattern language on uh, the on what is collaboration, which is a little bit different, which is and I think that, you know, there are, uh, you know, similar sort of shared languages that if we can figure out how to communicate them properly, it can have an impact. But this is shipping, you know, you can buy a, a you know, a deck for 30 bucks or something. There's uh, some stuff online on how to teach it. I gave them away as a gift when I had a I had a, a meeting of about twenty people years ago, and I gave everybody a group works card deck back then. Yeah. So um, uh, that's a cheap way. <laughs> so so, so uh, just a couple things, and I know that Sunil has to leave at the top of the hour, unfortunately. Um, 
A couple things. So here's the pattern language of group process, Dave Pollard, Tree Bresson, and a few other people, and probably a bunch of other people who showed up that I don't know about. Um, I have it under pattern languages, which itself, um, I don't know if anybody's familiar with it, but it kind of comes out of Christopher Alexander's, uh, and his, he and some colleagues wrote a book, A Pattern Language, back in 77. Um, pattern languages themselves are an example of trust in action or you know what I used to call the relationship economy in action. These days I realize that relationship economy is kind of a mystical phrase, so I talk more about trust and design from trust. But this thought here, examples of the relationship in, uh, economy in action, are in fact a lot of the, the things that, that uh, I'd be pointing to. And the, uh, the thing that I mentioned uh, when I was asking Christopher what this came from was this other super interesting uh, group process technique wisdom cluster called liberating structures, which is, a, a, I think, a different group of people. I don't know if, if there's much overlap between these groups, Christopher. Um, there is some, yes. Okay, good. Because this is another really, really valuable um, uh, set of... So let me actually connect these two just for fun um, so that if somebody finds one, they'll find the other one right away. Uh, so these are, ex these are totally examples of design from trust. And if, you know, if, I were, if I were to tell somebody how to go start uh, meetings and start you know, helping institutions, due to your question, um, I think one of, the, one of the good starting places is these two sets of uh, collective wisdom. Thank you. I, I shared in the um, in the chat a link to Meeples Together, a book that um, I did last year and it's coming out in a couple of weeks. Um, but you know, one of the things that may be an insight for people is that when we talk about collaboration and trust and all these tough things in the context of business and in these high emotional stakes things. Um, that those emotional stakes get in the way of learning how, how to, to use them. Mm -hmm. uh, when you, you know, basically use these in games and play, um, then it becomes, uh, you know, unlinked from that and you can learn a lot. And, um, uh, you know, I, I would, you know, apply that to pretty much, you know, anything. If there's some way, you know, you, you say, you know, you, you, I know uh, you would like to do some workshops on, um, the, you know, your um, uh, design with trust uh, thing. Um, I would, you know, for instance, suggest early on, figure out how to, you know, have it purely about, you know, maybe building a game together or, or something very, very playful uh, that involves trust in some fashion. And then that will basically... Uh, uh, allow you to, uh, you know, get rid of the, oh, well, we don't like governments or, you know, the, oh, this is about money and all these other things that cause, um, uh, you know, problems uh, and, and obstacles in learning. Awesome. Thank you. Looks like you got another meeting starting. <laughs> uh, hey, Roy. Hello, sorry. I suspect I've crashed in either it's five hours too early or four hours too late or something like that. That's awesome. Uh, so we are one hour into the first call today, which was about design uh, from trust and designing a workshop around that. There's, that's what I thought. That's what I thought. I realized I was either an hour late or an hour early, but is, of course I'm in, I'm in the UK, so I'm an hour late. <laughs> nice. So, this, so that's the one you were aiming for. You're that was what I was aiming for. Yeah, but actually <clears throat> I couldn't have I wouldn't have been able to make it anyway. I was on a dig life call at the same time. And that's how I got through to, I got introduced to this and so on and so forth. So uh, we just finished a board meeting there. So apologies for crashing into your conversation. I'll, I'll mute and, and listen and pay attention. I watched last week's video. Oh, thank and, you. And, and, and so. Thanks for being here. And you know what? I, I believe in the open space principles. So whoever was meant to be there, whoever is there was meant to be there. And when you crash in is like, for some reason you were meant to crash in. It's serendipity. Uh, yeah, absolutely. absolutely. I'm with you there. Judy, Good go ahead. Stuff. Roy, could you introduce yourself? I've not met you before. I'm Judy. Uh, no, no, nobody here will have met me before. Um, <coughs> or at least it would be in another life if it were. Um, what about me? I am a, originally a designer as in, as an artist, sculptor, designer, I spent 30 years in tech marketing, um, owned and ran three tech marketing agencies in the UK. 
sold my last one about four years ago. Since then, I've been working and interested in asynchronous communities. Um, I launched in my career, some of you may recall Lotus Notes and CompuServe in Europe. So ever since then, I've been fascinated by the dynamics of communities, digital communities, virtual communities, whatever. Uh, a couple of years ago, I became involved with Dig Life, which uh, Jerry will know about. Um, so I've literally just got a call off call for them. Um, that's kind of it. Uh, originally an artist, then through as a commercial designer, marketing type guy, um, now involved in about four similar communities. Um, so that's my, that's my focus going forward, really. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's really, that's super helpful and love the, so I wrote an article. Let me see <coughs> if I can find it in my brain for a second. I'm uh, also going to repeat the, 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 uh, governance debates that are going on the links that I sent, um, uh, earlier because he might be interested there. There's a lot of interesting stuff happening in the, in the blockchain community around decentralized government governance and blockchain governance and, and a lot of interesting debates there. Um, uh, missing one link. Where is the constrained unconstrained? Don't know. Um, so, so Roy, just for your amusement, um, I used to be a tech industry analyst. I was with a company called right. New Science Associates for uh, five years, and then I worked for Esther Dyson after that. All right. And, okay. <laughs> and right around 1989, yeah. so right when Lotus Notes came out. Oh yeah, that was that was smack in my that was smack in my time. So I wrote Absolutely. this piece for our clients yeah. called "Lotus is no longer a one product company," meaning I remember it. They were no longer a spreadsheet company, right? I, I remember that. I remember that article, Jerry. Oh, that's hilarious! Okay, that's absolutely <laughs> well, hilarious. Well, it was. It was. It was very true. It was something that fundamentally changed uh, the Lotus organization, and subsequently led to them becoming part of IBM, and so on, and so on, and so on. So, yeah, it's a continuum. And I'm uh, pretty sure that later I wrote a piece that, that said Lotus is once again a one-product company. <laughs> basically, basically about how dismayed I was about the way that notes, notes had eaten everybody's brain and, and IBM ended up on notes way too long. Yes. Right. Yes. They went from props yes. to notes and then kind of missing the internet stuff for, for well, way too long. Well, my first, my first agency was a, was a test case in, in Europe for Lotus Notes. We were an 80 man agency uh, and by the time we, uh, because it was one of the products we supported and you know, one of our clients. Um, and really after about two and a half years, I think we had more people working on notes than doing anything else in the agency. And an awful lot of people asking us, what on earth are you doing? Um, so it, yeah. But it was a very, it was, it, you know, it was a very interesting baptism of fire into this world that we're now, what is it, 15, 20, nearly years later? grappling with trying to and still struggling to, to build forward. a really good platform and still struggling to build a really good platform absolutely what, what uh, digital yeah. is about is like tech we can trust how do we create yep. decentralized how do we do the dap version of what notes promised yep. in an open independent collaborative sort of protected way yep yep well i think that's the added dimension because notes was as i recall it was very much it was a commercial product it was supposed to exist within the firewall all right there was there was some there was some uh, opportunity to come through the firewall but you had to be someone who was authentic and you had to be part of the corporate structure or whatever it was yeah um, and we now live at a time when that in itself is something that that is so open for debate identity privacy all of these issues which we were very imperfectly <clears throat> dealt with there but it was a, it was a place to start well, I if, I can, so. if I can tell a, a, a parallel story that, that dates back to almost exactly that time. Uh, there's this little company called General Magic that was quite famous in, in the Valley. They were very secretive for a while and I kind of made friends with them early on. And, and they then launched a Telestream, uh, sorry, Telescript and uh, Magic Cap. Magic Cap was basically the user interface for their devices and Telescript was their messaging engine. And right as right as the internet becomes publicly accessible and available, they ship a closed system that believes only in message passing. They, they basically picked precisely the wrong architecture <laughs> right when the internet opens up. And it, it was quite astonishing because they didn't really get it. They tried to, and, and the, the, the company cratered very quickly after the launch 
the actual launch of their devices. Yep. I have I have in a box in our storage unit, I have a little time capsule um, that has a Radio Shack Model 100, a couple of Palm Pilots, uh, uh, I don't remember what else, but in there is a Magic Link device, you know. Yep. From yeah, I'm, I've been trying to hunt down the, the telescript documentation for my anti-patent um, project. So there's oh, a lot of people in the rebooting, I mean, in the uh, blockchain community that are, um, um, you know, filing lots and lots of patents. Like I think Wells Fargo, who doesn't even have a blockchain, has no commitments to blockchain, has filed 300 plus patents on blockchain. Wow. Uh, so I have this book called Agorical Computing from 1988 that even though the word smart contract isn't used, it's in there and a whole bunch of things like, you know, token based stocks and all that kind of stuff are in there. That's in the box. I have uh, some books from things from Amex. Amex was the, the first sort of eBay, but it was really the sort of first smart contract platform. So when I joined Esther uh, in 92, one of my first tasks was I had to occasionally go publish our newsletter on Amex, which was a DOS interface. Yeah, it was. <laughs> it was free. <laughs> and it was. And, it, and every time I had to do this task, I had to call them up for tech support because I couldn't figure it out. It was the most <laughs> awful. It was the most awful publishing engine. <laughs> this was Phil Salen, right? Yeah. And yeah. Uh, you know some of his Phil Salen stuff. Uh, you know, the wealth of kitchens, I think, you know, it was just like the wrong time. I mean, if you look at like what Telescript was trying to do, yeah, uh, it's what, you know, all the big players are now trying to do to dominate their messaging platforms. Right. Uh, this is WhatsApp and, and uh, you know, uh, you know, the, the, the WeChat in China and, and stuff like that. Because it isn't just about security, it's about integrating with all of these other things, um, uh, you know, uh, you know, in China, there was this wonderful article about the difference between Amazon and the the, the equivalent platform using. I, I always forget because there's two two Chinese. Uh, Alibaba. Yeah. Well, anyhow, one of them is kind of the opposite of Amazon, but you know, which is they enable lots and lots of small vendors to directly sell. That's Alibaba. Um, that's yeah. Alibaba, yeah. Yeah, and um, you know, and how the the chat app and all that kind of stuff uh, enabled that, um, you know, in a you know oddly unfree country, uh, and yet in the United States, the free country, we you know we're all kind of locked into this hegemony of uh, of Amazon for you know our retail distribution and their and their dominance, which we can't fight in in law because. They're saving people money, which means they can't be uh, monopolized. Uh, antitrust antitrust uh, attack. Uh, right. It was just such a a weird juxtaposition of um, of things. So it's like every time we our conversation was going all sorts of different fun, interesting places, and every time we sort of bounce off an issue, I'm like, "Yep, there's a trust issue." So like, how antitrust law got co-opted. Right, and yeah. I've, got, I've got articles in my brain because I'm, I'm like, oh <laughs> shit, we went from antitrust yeah. being about damage, damage to citizens, to antitrust being protecting consumers, which meant that as long as as long as the company was hitting everyday low prices, they couldn't be accused of mono being monopolists. Right, Judy, go ahead. Well, it's just I'm I'm having the same reaction. This is so rich and so diverse that I'm hoping we're capturing all of these not only in the chat but also to lay out a roadmap of what we want to get, do deeper dives on in subsequent calls. Because any one of these, I mean, this one's gone very much in the direction of the block mapping, which is fine because it's new content for me and it's fascinating. And I'm still extracting, how do I apply that to my smaller communities? But to actually lay out a template of the richness of topics within Design for Trust conceptually from. And segment those into workshop models would be a fascinating group exercise. Yeah, I mean that's that's it. I'm I'm also feeling that um, that direction. So I mean, one of the things that rebooting does very different is that every everything we do, we try to ship something. Mm -hmm. So we'll have these kind of diverse dialogues in our first half day, quarter day, whatever. But then we quickly go down to okay, given all of this stuff. Is there something we can do in our remaining time that we can ship that is uh, 
you know, a curation or an incremental increase in knowledge. I mean, so we'll basically narrow down to go, oh, there's one thing in this discussion that we all resonate on. We all open up a Google Doc, and we do a bunch of research, and for the next day or two, we ship a paper. So we've shipped 40 some odd papers like that. I would love to see that replicated in, in other, other environments than uh, rebooting Web of Trust because it really does have this impact of, of um, you know, finding a few things where we can basically raise the bar <laughs> and, and iterate and, and demonstrate to the world because the brain and some of these kinds of discussions and open space sometimes lead to these, everybody being, being, all, being all excited um, about the opportunities and then they leave a, a conference or a meeting or whatever and it's like, well, we have we really changed things? Exactly. Have we, <laughs> I, I think that's an important point to emphasize because part of my questioning process has been how do you bring it back home for the individual, for the other people in the group? What's the next step that invites people to take the step toward the gainment of trust rather than hover at the boundary or even step back because it's overwhelming? And yep. so it seems to me that if we want to really have impact in communities, we need to think about how to get the first and second steps toward trust enabled by the communication system in a meeting with a working model you can take out of a meeting or out of a discussion to assist you in engaging more people in the topic. Yeah. So I'm especially interested in it as an icebreaker for, you know, moderate functional level as opposed to intense functional level groups. Right. Because that's kind of what the icebreaker should do. So I'm going to step back to sort of my, my introduction to designing a design from trust workshop, which is one way of looking at design from trust is as maybe a successor to design thinking, except it's different. So design thinking is a thing I can, I can train you up and you can go into the field and you can observe and be empathetic and prototype and you can come up with a solution that'll kind of work and it'll work. And there's been backlash against design thinking, et cetera, et cetera. We could, that's a different conversation. Uh, design from trust involves trust, which is sort of this reflexive thing that if you're not trustworthy um, and, and, you know, in your actions to design systems based on trust, it's going to screw everything up. So, so it changes the implementer and it requires transparency, vulnerability, a bunch of other things going in. So that, that, that's kind of the, the, I began with this, how do, how do I turn this into a workshop much like I could do a design thinking workshop? And then I'm like, oh shit. This, this kind of falls back on the implementer and, and it, it involves different dynamics that I need to understand better. So then I was like, well, design from trust operates at many different levels and I haven't, I haven't enumerated them all, but there's the interpersonal level down here, which is like right now we're on a call, we're talking to each other, how do, how do we build trust? What goes on when you walk into a room with strangers? All that, you know, the, the interpersonal and small group dynamics are super important and interesting. And I was saying a little earlier, one of the things that we're doing that's problematic is we're, we're, we're often replacing this, this interpersonal dynamic with technology that lets us trust climbing into somebody's car or borrowing their, you know, borrowing their, their living room or their house. So a, as I climb up, I get to wholesale organizational change. I get up to industrial policy. I get up to government, you know, uh, sort of intergovernmental things. And you get very quickly to China's social credit system. You get very quickly toward mistrust. Uh, then coming in as a force from the side, maybe doing a kind of a force field analysis on these layers um, are things like a whole bunch of players out in the political sphere have discovered that you can weaponize trust, that you can use, you can intentionally provoke mistrust to destroy your enemies. And this is not a new strategy. This is an ancient time honored strategy. It's just that we're in an era now where this is, this is surged at a moment where, um, a lie travels around the world 30 times before truth can get its pants on is roughly the quote, right? Um, it, it, you know, social media plus connectivity plus everything else that's going on has really driven uh, the, the, our ability to lie like crazy. And it does not help that the major platforms we are all on, like Facebook, have as they're in a business model to get more attention than to suck data from us and sell off that data, which is partly why a lot of us are here. It's like, how do we build a web of trust? How do we build dApps? How do we build tech we can trust? All those things are in some sense a, 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 a counter movement to this invasion of our lives by these technologies. So, so partly I'm trying to figure out in design from trust, 
which, how do we articulate the layers? And that's, I think that's where I'm going to go probably next is like, let's just, let's just enumerate the layers and then let's pick the low hanging fruit. So Judy, you're really interested in walking into a group of people you've, you've got some track record with and helping them figure out how, what, how, what do we do to build trust? And, and I'll let you articulate what are the top three or four questions around trust that matter in that setting. And then let's go flesh that out. Let's create an artifact. Could just be an article on Medium. It could be a, a thing, an exercise people can pick up. Could be any series of things. And let's play that out. And, and then let's, let's sort of figure out where in, in this little, I don't want to call it a stack because it start, starts sounding like a, you know, ISO stack. And I, and I fear ISO stacks. Um, but how do we actually sort of tackle different parts of this so that we can start moving forward and different people can congregate around the parts of this puzzle that they like, right? And I, and I have a, a simple, very simple website built on Google sites at designfromtrust.com, which I'm happy to give people, you know, uh, uh, right access to so that together we can begin building things. We can also co-author things and post them and then cross post them and refer to them. Everything that we talk about, I go back and harvest and, and sort of add to my brain. So that's, there's this sort of curated web of, of context on the side uh, that helps. And I'm trying to figure out, okay, what is the dynamic where these things could play together really fruitfully over time as Christopher was explaining? Go ahead, Judy. Part of what, I, what I'm really interested in, I like everything you said, absolutely spot on. I'm also interested, not just in my individual groups, but as you move up the levels of complexity, how do you insert yourself as a dendritic starting point for trust um, as an individual, as a collective group, as a participant in the community who's going to a council meeting, all these different levels where decisions are being made. I, I have a sense that there's that certainly the basic things of personal exposure and vulnerability are important, but I think there's the opportunity to create a powerful social movement by a change of behavior in multiple dimensions that becomes another speed of light networking kind of thing because I think humanity is hungry for trust. And I love what you just said. Um, this Friday morning at the same time, the call is an Inside Jerry's Brain call about something I call up keto, uh, I which I'll explain about it. I'll explain very briefly right now, but um, I've been doing a, a, some Aikido on the side, that's my sport. And Aikido, is, and I'll say this again on Friday, but Aikido is the, I is harmony, he is chi, is universal life energy, and do is the way, judo, uh, you know, all those, probably Nintendo, who knows? Um, <laughs> the way of Ninten. Um, and so I, I married Aikido to uplift or upward spiral as a neologism in order to create a practice that helps people learn how to improve everything they touch, which is sort of this upward spiral kind of, kind of concept. And so, and so I'm really interested in, in, in uh, there being an upketo, a virtual upketo dojo that invents some practices that include what you just said. W what is a practice I can bring to a group that does some of these things, that these dynamics. Ken so, will be a great contributor as well. Exactly. So, so a keto kind of connects to design from trust as a playful, a little bit time. And to me, humor is really important here because it trust in particular, if you take it too seriously and you're like, Oh, trust me, trust. Me, it doesn't really work. So I'm interested in how do we do this with a little tongue in cheek, but with serious intent um, to play out some practices that anybody can go pick up and use. Cause uh, you know, I think, I think open sourcing these things is the way to go. Well, if you, if you ever want to do a, uh, in, you know, an in-person thing, I have this great exercise that basically where people create a game together and there's a process by which they create a game together. But then what, what it's really about, and it, you know, it's, you know, you know, think simple, you know, sorry, Monopoly or whatever to, but mm -hmm. at the end of it, you end up being able to have this sort of larger dialogue about, you know, what is, the, you know, how did we cooperate to do that? Um, and again, it's kind of like what you were, you were just saying, if you, if you can get it out of the, 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 you know, certain context into the play context, it just allows for a lot, you know, more um, possibility of learning. I do have to roll. Um, you have to I, roll. Yes. Uh, so I, I, it was nice meeting everybody. I hope I can't do all of these things. You tend to do them in the morning, which is when the, my European clients all want to meet me. 
or various standards things. So, uh, but I try to attend when I can. I will make next week's DFT call in the afternoon because I move them around just to make it kind of random who, who can show up. And I don't, I don't have time to doodle everything. I hate doodle polls. They're like crazy making <laughs> better to figure out, to actually, actually try to figure out to include people is harder than it, than it needs to be. Um, thanks for being here. Um, I want to pass the floor to Roy in a second, but I just wanted to mention real quick, um, does everybody know Arthur Brock? Yep. Amazing guy. Um, so he is the uh, uh, Agile Learning Center's Holochain. He's a certifiable genius. And one of the things he's invented is a process called game shifting, which is, which is a group process technique that he used for a meeting I, uh, I was hosting once. He, he sort of ran that part of the meeting using just a whiteboard uh, or a, a marker board. And, uh, and he was busy tracking the meeting. And I had this sort of notion that there would be a beautiful iPad app the, uh, that game shifting could become a really beautiful iPad app and that one of the elements of it, and I'll explain it in more detail some other time, would be that you could bring in group process techniques into the app and the app would help you step through them. It would basically coach you through Christopher's game building exercise or um, you know, what have you, or the vul a vulnerability exercise or a mindfulness breathing practice or, you know, these things would simply be available to be brought into the app to run through um, and then to keep in your library of tools of the trade forever. Like, cause, cause mostly experts in facilitation and group process have a whole bunch of skills, but one of the things they have is a, is a bag of tricks. They have, a, they have a, a bunch of things they've used over and over again that work really well that they can just pull out and implement right away. And, and how do we make, how do we make this easily accessible? And that the group works deck that Christopher was talking about and the liberating structures are attempts to do this, to publish these, these sort of collections of really great um, ways of, of helping humans uh, collaborate and trust one another. So with that, to you, Roy. Um, in a way, this, this possibly speaks to the question of trust, and it, it is only a question. Um, we, on this call, and funnily enough, the call I've just come from as well, we're all roughly the same demographic, roughly the same age, roughly the same experience, history we started, I, I crashed in talking about my personal history. Now, we come from a, a domain where interpersonal trust was by and large formed, uh, I mean, most of my client base used to be in the US, I was in Europe. So it would have been done by phone, uh, or it would have been done by people getting on planes and flying across the Atlantic. But it was broadly speaking, it was face to face communication of some form. And even the telephone uh, actually gave a certain kind. Uh, it was a single medium. It was a single way of communicating. Phones so are really intimate. It's super interesting. It was very, very intimate. Exactly. Now, Going forward and very soon, there is going to be a generation for whom the determinants of trust are multiple. So, you, so you know, the phenomenon of people, for example, breaking up with a text. Now, at, at, for, for, for my generation, that would have either been face to face or if you were feeling extremely timorous, it would have been a note. But by and large, it was a very personal thing and we, we, we treasured trust. It was significant. We recognized it up front. Now, the technologies that are being used increasingly and almost universally by a new generation, trust, I'm fairly certain, is, is not an inter it, it's built, it is not built into those systems at all. They're designed to enable rapid disconnections. Uh, uh, avatars, you know, um, you know, the whole, the whole, the whole framework that this upcoming generation is going to have to deal with is fundamentally different to the one we have. Um, and I find this particularly now I'm, I'm involved with a, a, a cooperative, another quite well, uh, a large cooperative, basically formed by people in their, I suppose, probably from the, the late teens, early sort of twenties up to probably their mid thirties. They're all technologists. They're distributed all over the country. They're making community contact across the world with other similar communities. They're, they're extremely aware of the public importance of action, trust, political trust, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But they are still within this, uh, they still see, they seem to have a different concept of, of the, I, I'm, trying, I'm sort of struggling for, for a way of describing it, but it's, I suppose it's a very simple thing. 
if I, once upon a time, if I sent somebody an email or any kind of communication, I expected a response. Even if it was just something that carried the conversation forward. Now, I'm not in the least, but I used to be shocked when I didn't get a response. Now I'm not. Mm -hmm. I take that as being, that's an accepted process now. It's accepted behavior. So I think this is all over the map, though, because, for example, yeah. there was a really nice, I think, NPR report about teen girls on Instagram. And the reason they were sitting at dinner da, 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 is that there was this expectation of all near instantaneous liking of everything everybody else was doing. <clears throat> and not catching up with that was a reason to be cut, cut out of the group, that, that there yep. was this extremely high touch instantaneous communication with very blunt, like liking or not liking, right? But like really yep. stupid, this, this bit, you know, 8-bit graphic version of emotion. But if, <laughs> but if you weren't there in a timely fashion and you didn't do the right things with the right groups of people, you were out. You were sort of yes. social, socially cut out. Yep, so, yep. so I, and then I tell the story really often. Um, oh, what was her, what's her name? Uh, the woman who ran Lambda Moo, uh, Amy Bruckman. She once wrote long, long ago, she said, um, uh, at one point she types uh, her character name, uh, bites its lip and uh, bites its lip and looks, looks at its shoes. And, and, and this was on a pure text Moo interface. And I'm like, that was beautiful and eloquent. And I was just recently, a couple of days ago, uh, there was a question asked of me of, well, how do you help people, you know, how do we do diversity? How do we help people get to meet other people online? And I was like, you know what? The plain text interface mm -hmm. masks where you came from that you're huge or little or green or purple or any, it masks it. And it's really useful in particular when after doing something interesting that connects, you then reveal identities and go, oh, shoot, you're the kind of person I would have tried to shoot or would have run from or whatever else mm -hmm. afterward. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to figure out, among many other exercises, how might we create places where those things happen in, in a safe way? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How might we create yep. instances of connectivity across these communities where they don't know they're talking to the enemy as they've been raised? Because as, as in, in the uh, musical South Pacific, there's a song, you've got to be carefully taught, mm -hmm. right? which is basically about racism, that, that, that we're not born racist, we're taught to be racist by our culture. We're taught to hate other people. So in many cases, we just have to, un, we have to like hit control Z over and over again and un, hit undo on these cultural trainings. I have a pretty mm -hmm. negative um, attitude about socialization. I think that most of our problems are due to our socialization worldwide. <laughs> that socialization destroys the innate Connectivity we feel just you know destroys a whole bunch of things that we're just born with, unfortunately. And some of this came out with, from my first girlfriend introducing me to Alice Miller, the, the Swiss psychologist. Yeah. Anyway, those are each of them interesting tangents, and we're at the top of ninety minutes now. Uh, Roy, I'm, I'm I, I hate that you jumped in at the at the top of the first hour. I'll be back. I, I love this. <laughs> uh, my problem oh, is if I if, if I move. If I move this conversation to the afternoon next week, it's too late for you in the UK. Uh, not necessarily. Like not two, necessarily. 2 p.m. Pacific is what, nine year time or 10? That's yeah, it's, it's, I, I, I have a wife who's an academic and she's up at all hours of the night producing papers and things. So yeah. <laughs> it's <Okay>. not, <laughs> no, no, I mean, I think this is a, this is a, uh, this is, this is a very large rabbit hole to go down and it's, it's something that, I, I try, it's just come up in so many spaces recently, this concept of trust, what it is, how do you generate and create trust? So, yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, so, I will, so are you on, I forget which list, of, if any of mine that you're on, are you on uh, the trust list? I, I, get, I, get, I get your email, that's it at the moment. Sounds um, great. So, the Inside yeah. Jerry's Brain list is the most inclusive one because I, I tend okay. to overpost to that. Okay. Um, if you think of other people who would enjoy this conversation and bring good stuff to it, please invite them in. Yeah, will do. No, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Judy. Can you remind people about the ability to share things in the, the blog mode or the whatever we call the chat that's ongoing in the groups? Because I think there's so much rich content here. We could pull a lot of that in outside of the conversation and then speak to the highlights of it. So people aren't using the lists right now yet to have these conversations, which I would like. Um, it, you could provoke that just by chatting about some of the points you liked here and, and I'll answer you and then we'll see who else kicks in. We got some I, of it after Hannah's talk. Yeah. That was yeah. 
you know, and I, I think it, partly because she was so open, it, in, it inspired all of us to jump in with open sharings as well. So maybe exactly. we, could, we could be a working group on this topic ourselves. Uh, totally the intention. And I will post this thing to YouTube and the chat to the, the, the list and all that so everybody can see the chat, but you don't get the richness of it. And my MO is weird. I like sort of go with the flow for a while and see where the conversation shows up and then like it suddenly gets interesting. And I, 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 that's just the way it goes. But, but when people trip into the beginning of, of most of my Zoom calls, they're like, mm -hmm, what's going on here? What's, remind me again the call this afternoon. So this afternoon, let me look at, I've got four calls set up. This one was designing the, the workshop. This afternoon is, are things getting better or getting worse? Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, Friday, Friday morning at 9 Pacific is Apkido, like introduction to Apkido. And then Friday afternoon at 2 is the unschooling design questions. It's like if you, if you wanted to actually build uh, scaffolding for, for unschoolers, what would you build? Could you put all four of those in one note um, or... You know, I'd like to forward this to a few people that I've been trying to get to come in live. And so far, it's like, I can't come in live, but I'll try to watch the video. But then I'm not sure they get there. Yeah, exactly. Um, so three of them are in one invite already, which I think I sent out last night. So I can copy paste the other one and, and forward that to you. Okay, great. Thank you. Cool. Thank you. Um, go ahead, Roy. Any, any wrapping words? No, no, that's it. That's, that's, thank you very much. Um, good to have been here. And yeah, pretty I missed the first hour, but hey. That's the way it goes. Love having you here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Judith. Okay. See you guys the other side. Bye Cheers. Guys.